This is Dave Meltzer with Entrepreneurs, the playbook in the greatest stadium ever created with one of the greatest entrepreneurs ever created, Jason Haugen. He's the CEO, founder of Haugen RV Group. Welcome to the playbook. Dave, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, from the day I met you, I had to have you on because when I see the spirit of excellence and I know the spirit of excellence by the people that you surrounded yourself with and how you carried yourself and how your interest was in helping other people, uh, especially at your age, it just became a necessity to have you on the playbook because I want to know how at such a young age you have the wisdom to understand value and culture. Uh, it means a lot. And, you know, people are, like, I feel like it's my sixth sense with people and I feel like like relationships and people and feeding it, like feeding into people really fulfills me. And so I'm always looking about how I can level up or, or give someone a, a, a unique experience. I had a really unique childhood. And so like a lot of like money and like those, those things, like I'm, I've done those before. So it's like, how can I create an environment for other people and care about other people where they can have an environment or an experience that they've never, never had before. And providing that value means a lot to me, any way that I can help somebody. And because you were exposed to a more affluent background than a lot of great entrepreneurs, you understand fear and risk in a different way because a lot of kids who grow up with being around better and greater wealth have fear to do it themselves. Right. They're afraid to lose what they already have where there is an advantage of poor kids like me that I had nothing to lose. Right. And so my baseline was I have nothing to lose. So even when I was super wealthy, I still had that attitude. Right. Uh, for you, how were you able to be motivated when you already had most of the things that you wanted? Well, it's, it's easy. My mom and dad uh, definitely made it a point to let us know that they were rich and we were broke. Nice. And so as kids, and you know, I bought my own car when I was 16, paid for my own gas, bought my own insurance, paid for my own phone, my own clothes. I had to get a job. Um, we even played sports. I say we have, you know, twin brother and other, other uh, brother and sister. And they made us get jobs right, right then and pay for everything. And even with sports, they were like, hey, sports isn't a job. It's not paying the bills. You need to learn how to have a job and play sports at the same time. So they were hard on us. I mean, I, I, we lived a different life. Even people that maybe their parents didn't have as much money lived a, almost a better life than we did as kids. An easier life. An, e an easier, an easier yeah. life. Like, we, like my mom and dad had an airplane. We never flew on it. And they made it very clear, like, hey, you, never, you do not deserve a seat on the airplane. You never earned it. So we're gonna fly on it and you can fly, you know, commercial, which we, we didn't expect anything. Like it was yeah. never a thing where that expectation was there. And so when we got out of high school, we all kind of were like, had that hustle mentality. It's like, we have to go get it our own. Mom and dad aren't gonna give us anything and nor is my attitude, do I want anything from them? I want knowledge and, you know, very successful business. Um, my mom and dad both are. And so that's, that was my mindset coming out as I have the motivation to, to, to be like them because their lifestyle was pretty cool, yeah. but to do it on my own. Like I wanted to be Jason Haugen. I didn't want to be the son of, you know, Randy and Valerie Haugen or whatever. Like, I wanted to be Jason Haugen. I want to go make my own name. And what about your siblings? Did it, they all uh, adhere to the exact same mindset? You know, kind of. My sister owns her own grocery store. She does, yeah. she does well. I would say me and her are very similar. Um, and both of my brothers work for our RV company. Yeah. And so one of them is an inventory director. One of them is a parts director. And so, um, you know, they're, they're entrepreneurial spirit. But, I, you know, me and my sister are very different. And I would say I'm more like my mom and dad in that aspect. And what about balance? Um, I'm sure it sounds like your parents had a great positive mindset and were empowering people. But they must have had to work a lot to oh, yeah. build that type of empire. Yeah. Um, and what takeaways have you had about what most people call work-life balance. I call it activity I get paid for, right. activity I don't get paid for balance. Right. Uh, but that weighted balance, what are some of the lessons that you learned that you're utilizing today? Because it seems like, although you're extremely successful in activity you get paid for, you also still have a great uh, family balance and health balance. Yeah, and it's just a decision, right? Like I, 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 I'm intentional with my schedule. And so I schedule out the things with my daughter. I schedule out the things, you know, I'm, I'm divorced so, and now remarried. And so I only have my daughter every, you know, once a week for an overnight and then every other weekend. So I'm very intentional about every Thursday and Friday, like everybody knows and our whole company and everything that, that Jason usually tries to be at home with his daughter because I get one day a week. Um, but I'm intentional. My mom and dad did things very different. I mean, they built a massive, massive, you know, did 
billions in sales back in the day and they did it with no cell phones, no internet, nothing like that. And so they had to be on the road a lot. They were on the road over 300 days a year for 25 years. And I always looked at that. I'm like, there comes a struggle with kids with that. Like, you know, not ever having mom and dad there. You know, we did live a great life when they weren't, you know, it, it yeah. was awesome. But it, I, I wanted to be more present and be home with my family. And so creating an, an environment like that and still having success, whatever that means. But really, I view success as, as growing up with, or, you know, like watching my daughter and, you know, grow up and my future kids grow up. My wife is pregnant right now. So that's very important to me. And, you know, so I'm intentional about it. And Jason, you know, culture is really one of the preeminent things that I teach uh, for my own company, but for other leading CEOs in the world. And I think it's underrepresented. I think it's undervalued. And you are one of those people that also put it in a preeminent position of prioritization that culture comes first. In fact, I think your podcast is called uh, The Culture Camp. Right. And right. you're a very culture centric person. I'm going to start with a very simple question, you know, coming from being younger than I am, right. what does culture mean to you? Culture, it, it's hard to explain, but the best way to put it is culture is a feeling and it's how you feel when you walk, like we're in SoFi Stadium and I would say the culture of the stadium is, is, is like excellence, right? Like you walk in, security is excellent, right? Like it's tight. Everything is very clean. I mean, it's, it's, it's a feeling that you have you know, when you walk into a business or when you're dealing with somebody. And so culture, is, you know, in a business is dealing with your people, creating an environment where they can excel, give, you know, giving them the tools for success. Um, there, there's so much that goes into it, especially, you know, when someone, when you might see someone struggling, it's figuring out why they're struggling. You know, are they in the best position, or the, you know, personality wise and management style wise of how to best set them up for success where they can get it going, you know, 100%. It's like going down the freeway and you have a, you know, a, a five or six lane freeway, then the spaghetti bowl, all of a sudden you start having these on and off ramp and then it starts to get a little confusing. Usually there's traffic and then we can kind of go on from there. It's getting everybody aligned going in the same direction for the same reasons, maybe not at the same speed because everybody's different, but it's getting them to go in the same direction. And one of the things I found with culture that it addresses is I think the biggest disruption in business today, which is engagement. I think there's this separation now that people don't have the same type of engagement that you grew up with when you worked for your parents and right. building your businesses and understanding um, how do you see the culture that you have built uh, directly impact the engagement of your employees? Oh, it's everything. I mean, we, I want everybody to take ownership in what they do and be fully engaged and fully present in everything that they do. And, you know, we have a lot of engagement surveys, satisfaction survey, surveys. We have a software that is, is all about that in satisfaction surveys, engagement surveys, making sure that we are doing the right things. Because in a lot of companies, there is a disconnect between, you know, you can say corporate in the field or corporate in the direct you know, labor that, that's, that's doing, that's working the business. And so how can you bridge the gap and get people engaged and get them bought in and, and go in for the same, you know, the same cause, the same reasons. Now, maybe they're not 100% bought into your dream because you, your dream is very different, but all doing things, you know, for the, you know, you have a mission statement, you're all there for the same reasons and engaging them in a way that gets them excited to do what they do every day. And one of the questions I wanted to ask you, because uh, looking at you it reminds me of myself when I was younger and I'm trying to look at the things that I just didn't know and when we were talking about engagement you know it really struck me that I had a misperception of how engaged certain employees would be you had mentioned you know not everyone is going to care as much as you not everyone's in the same position has the same skills same knowledge or desire right um, how have you been able to manage your own expectations when you're hyper fully engaged person, hyper productive, accessible and gracious person. And yet you have to have certain employees, you know, that are there that, you know, may wash the RVs or right. may do certain things within the context of what they want to get out of your business. How do you manage your own expectation not to be disappointed when you see someone that you want more for than they want for themselves? You know, that, that's a great question because there are often times that you want more out of someone than they want than they want to give you or they want to put into something. But it's having those conversations and understanding really what they want. Like if, if they're just like, there's a lot of people who I have offered management positions to because they might qualify the best as, you know, they're their job. But then they come back at me and be like, look, I don't want to go home and think about work. 
I don't want to worry about this. I don't want to travel. You know, I want a nine to five and I want to punch in, punch out. Okay. Well now we're in alignment. We're on the same page. I know what the expectations are from you. And then, you know, I'm going to go, but you know, I tell them, Hey, I'm going to go, obviously, you know, someone's got to be the manager here. So we're going to have that conversation. I want you to help me pick, you know, help, help me with this conversation with the next person, because I think you're the best, you know, you're really good at your job. Let's, let's do this together. Let's all have ownership in this. And, and it, it's tough. I mean, it, sometimes it's like this, it's disheartening with people because you're like, ah, you see so much potential, but sometimes it's just not the right timing. Sometimes they need to go through things sometimes, you know, in personal life, but it's, 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 it being intentional and finding that out of, of really why and maybe like maybe you're disappointed but then figure out hey why why don't you want to do this or why don't you want to do that or this situation like it's it's kind of going in being an investigator and in your own team and, and finding really their why right and speaking of your why when i was younger i had a horrible relationship with money and you know <laughs> i grew up with none it meant something different right to me than it did it does today um how would you describe your relationship with money today coming from your unique background and being able to be in this, you know, really unique situation, so successful at a young age? All right, money, so money was never talked about in my growing up, good or bad. It was never talked about. Like my mom, my dad and mom are very frugal people. Like, you know, only shopped literally for clothes at Walmart. Nice. Um, you know, they only went to McDonald's. Like they only went, you know, to be, like it was a very, they were very frugal, but it was never because you know, money was not like an object to us. It was just a tool, right? And so I totally look at money like a tool to get, you know, to help people, to get, to have fun experiences. Like I, I think of money as what it represents. And the fact that you can, you know, pay, you know, pay for something then have a great experience in Hawaii or whatever that means. And so that's really my, my view of it is how can I, obviously like I, you know, like I like more of it, right? But it's not everything to me. Like I don't wake up and think about money, 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 money. I think about how can I create something exciting and create a new company or affect people or you know employ people. Like I'm happy to pay a couple million dollars a month in payroll. Like that makes me happy. Like we're affecting people here. You know we're feeding. You know I think someone told me it's like eight thousand meals a week to to people. Like that means a lot to me. And so that's how I view view that. Yeah, it's funny. Money does not buy love or happiness, but. It allows you to shop and you're someone I see shopping for the right things for the right reasons, which brings uh, great fulfillment. Now, at a young age, you've also been divorced and yep. you had mentioned, you know, your daughter and what that is. And I think it's really important. A lot of people don't talk about the challenges of, you know, maybe being married young and being an entrepreneur right. and the lessons that they've learned. And I think it's one of the biggest questions a lot of younger entrepreneurs ask me who get into a situation in their their family life or especially their marriage is you know really impeded right uh, what lessons did you learn from your first marriage that you're taking into the second marriage especially with a new baby coming oh so much i mean when i was an entrepreneur back then um i traveled never cared like i thought what i was doing was i was supposed to bring home a paycheck and she could live a great life at home when she just wanted me home she wanted me to be present like she was a big fan of what I was doing, but she's like, I, I, she's like, you don't care. And I'm like, am I supposed to care? Like I, I'm doing everything yeah, I'm supposed to do. That. Right. Thank you for like, your honesty. Yeah. I mean, am I, I, supposed I to care? yeah, like I'm in my, in my, like, and so like in my, I was so hyper focused on, on, you know, getting to where I wanted to be. Taking, that, like you were so busy taking care of your family. You forgot to take I care talk, of your forget, family. <laughs> exactly. That's a great way to put it. Yeah. And well, I should probably call her and tell her that right now. But, uh, and we have a fantastic relationship now, like me and my wife now. She and forgave she, you. Yeah. She forgave me. <laughs> um, you know, we we go on double dates with them all the time. Yeah. And they're a great, great, but like, I, I learned to, to control my own calendar and control my own decisions more myself instead of let everybody dictate where I was going to be. I was a yes man back then. I would do anything for everybody. I mean, I lived on a plane. I loved flying, you know, being a diamond on Delta and flying 125. Right. Like, you know, that was like what I lived for. And now, like I posted the other day on my Instagram, I was like, I've only flown nine times this year you know, on Delta. We, we have our own plane, but like a nine right. times yeah. on Delta. And I'm like, I'm happy about that. Like, I'm very happy about that. Like I'm paying like, to myself, I'm fulfilling and like, I'm, I'm, I'm getting to spend more time with my family. And, but back then I just didn't care. I mean, it, and that sounds so bad cause I loved my wife, you know, yeah. my ex-wife now, I loved my daughter, um, still do, <laughs> you know, and it really mattered to me, but I, I looked at it in a different, different aspect. And so now I control what I do and, and how I operate. And I feel so much better cause I'm not stressed out about that part. And, and it's being intentional with my, with my wife now. 
It's planning those date nights. It's making sure that I'm home. It's communication. Like I would, I can't, I went on a 10 weekend tour when speaking one time and I never even told my ex-wife that I was doing it. I just said, okay. And then came home and was like, hey, just let you know, I'm going to be gone for the next 10 weekends. And she's like, we have this event and that event. I'm like, I'm not going to be there. I don't care. Now it's that communication with my, with my wife. Yeah. Being intentional with time is uh, an absolute must. And it's a common denominator for those people that are purposeful, profitable, and passionate about what they're doing. Um, beyond that too is the future. One of my biggest nemesis is when I was worth over a hundred million in my twenties was I lost track of where I wanted to be when I'm 55. Right. And by losing everything, it allowed me to have a reset. Right. You seem to have a great perspective without needing a reset, without being born poor, without, you know, losing anything, you know, right. it sounds like the marriage has been kind of the bigger challenge or bigger lesson in your personal life. Um, but how do you determine your future objectives? I call them trajectories, right. not even goals. But for you, you seem to be very clear on what you want to do through your 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. Right. Well, it's, it's kind of a crazy story. So in 2017, I actually did lose everything. I, I was uh, the highest paid earner in, in a network marketing company, and that network marketing company got sold, and I lost everything. And so I went from making a lot of money to no money, and then I was literally sweeping floors at a cabinet shop and building cabinets through the middle of the night. It's kind of a, kind of a crazy story. And so that made me really look about what How really... Old were you? I was uh, 24. Yeah. And it really made me look at life a lot differently because I'm, because my dad always gave he always said this to me is build like it will never end, but prepare for it to end tomorrow. And I never did that. And so now I'm doing more things of like, okay, I'm preparing and all these things like I'm making sure we're all set. But then, you know, when I look towards the future, it's what fulfills me and makes me happy at the end of the day, if I, if I ever did lose anything, am I doing something that I'm on the right path that makes me happy? and that fulfills me and is helping other people because I, I really feel like that's my calling is helping other you know people and whatever that means and so when I look for like the 30 35 you know five years the 35 year old me or the the 40 year old me I'm like I just want to be you know the best husband the best father I possibly can be and help as many people as I possibly can and have an impact that is a positive impact on people and you're having that already which is outstanding yeah it's funny I used to tell people when I'm coaching them about exit strategies I said best exit strategy is to build a company that you'll never sell right and you'll get more offers than you'll ever believe if you're right. building a company that you'll never sell the worst thing you do is build a company to sell right uh, and you're nailing yeah, that. and you see that a lot in like tech companies is they just buy it and, and, and everybody knows and it, it never ends up being what they think it's gonna be I mean they're like hey this is gonna be a two-year run I'm like ah that's not really like that doesn't feel good right like no. I, I want to build that lasting legacy company where I want people to retire, like retire. I can't wait for retirement parties. I've had one, I've had one <laughs> retirement party, but I can't wait to start doing that where it, it that means a lot. Like you, like you said, you st stuck with us. Right. Yeah. It's so, it's so great. Um, all right. Last question as we go through mindset, heart set and hand set. Do you have a go-to mantra, go-to quote? Is there, you know, something that you go to when you have that rocky moment and you get knocked down everybody gets hit in the face every day right what's your mindset hard set or hand set when stuff doesn't go as you plan uh, an old saying my mom always used to say it, it uh, and the saying is if it is to be it's up to me and like you know you get you have to make it happen like you can stand there get knocked down do all of these things and you can look yourself in the mirror but if you got to say if it is to be it's up to me it, i have to make it happen like i did bodybuilding competitions and i love that because like my coaches could give me all of the tools, all the nutrition, all the workouts, but at the end of the day, I had to lift the weight, I had to do everything, it, it, it was all up to me. And so when I'm ever going through something, I look, I have that conversation in the mirror, and like if it is to be, it's up to me, and I have to make it happen, and I gotta go figure that out. I'll tell you what, Jason, I've done <clears throat> over 1,400 of these podcasts, The Playbook Alone, thousands wow. of all the different uh, podcasts and TV shows that I have, and there's one thing that I look for, and it's a, what I call a spirit of excellence, whether it's Cameron Diaz or Sadhguru, Deepak Chopra, Marshall Falk, whoever it may be, right. uh, they all have this spirit of excellence and it's the I must be what I can be attitude. Right. And uh, you certainly portray that the best that I've seen for a guy as young as you. So it means a lot. Thank you very much. I want to thank you flattered. for sharing uh, and being vulnerable as well. Some of the more personal ways and personal playbooks to success 
uh, that's going to take you that humility even further than you can imagine. Take it from an old guy uh, who has <laughs> ran the playbook a few times. The incredible Jason Hagen, he's here, CEO of Hagen RV Group and an entrepreneur. We'll have him back on, I'm sure, here at the incredible SoFi Stadium. This is Dave Meltzer with Entrepreneurs, The Playbook.